Hi, this is Michael Altos. We are continuing our discussion of circulation, and this is recording part six. We've discussed so much about body fluids, about vessels, about capillaries. Now we're going to talk about how the body decides where to send blood flow. Blood flow to different tissues is based on what the tissues need in order to deliver oxygen and nutrients, remove acid and carbon dioxide, maintain proper ion concentrations, transport hormones, and any other requirements. This table shows us that blood flow to different organs varies quite widely, and it depends on two different things. It depends on the size of the tissue, and it also depends on the needs of the tissue in order to allow the heart only to pump as much blood as needed. So for example, we can look at, um, let's look at the liver and the kidneys. The liver and the kidneys both get about 25% of cardiac output, which is about 1,200 milliliters per minute. But the kidneys are much smaller than the liver. And so per 100 grams of tissue, the kidneys are getting much more blood flow. The kidneys are very, very metabolically active and require a large amount of oxygen to do their job. And we can compare that to any part of the body. We can see the adrenal glands, which get a very tiny percent of cardiac output. But because they are so active, they get a very large amount of cardiac output given their very tiny size, 300 milliliters per minute per 100 grams of tissue. Again, the goal is to see that the heart only needs to pump as much blood as needed so that each tissue gets as much as it needs. How does the body adjust control of local blood flow? Well, immediately on the order of seconds to minutes, there can be rapid changes in vasodilation or vasoconstriction, and there are several theories to explain this. One is that vasodilators are responsible. When tissue metabolism increases or oxygen saturation goes down, blood flow goes up because of vasodilators being released, like adenosine or carbon dioxide or histamine, in response to inadequate blood supply. A related theory is the oxygen demand theory, which says that as oxygen levels go down, smooth muscles will automatically relax and vasodilate. A third theory is called reactive hyperemia, which says that if a blood supply is blocked, then when it's unblocked, there will be increased blood flow to compensate for the lack of blood flow. The theory we should definitely understand is the one called autoregulation, which says that as arterial blood pressure changes within a certain normal range, local blood flow to tissues will immediately increase but quickly return to normal with one to two minutes. So here we have a pressure of 100. Pressure goes up to 180, and blood flow to that tissue hasn't really changed at all. That's autoregulation. Obviously, if we drop pressure to zero, or if we shoot it up to 250, then yes, we will see some changes in blood flow. But within a normal physiologic range, autoregulation says that some tissues will not have changes in blood flow. So that tells us about our acute control due to vasodilation or vasoconstriction. In the longer term, over the course of days to months, we can actually change the number or the size of blood vessels that supply different tissues as needs change. The nervous system plays an important role in regulating blood pressure, and it's the rapid system. It occurs in under 30 seconds. The sympathetic nervous system has fibers that originate from your thoracic and lumbar spinal nerves, and they innervate the smooth muscles in your blood vessels, which allows the arterioles to have vasoconstriction, which increases resistance and increases blood pressure. It allows the veins to vasoconstrict, which will displace blood out of the venous system back towards the heart and increase preload and cardiac output, and they can also increase heart rate and contractility directly in the heart. There are several cardiovascular reflexes that you should understand. The first is called the arterial baroreceptor reflex. 
This is triggered by stretch or pressure receptors that are located in the walls of certain large arteries, like the carotid arteries and the aortic arch. When these arteries detect increased pressure, they send signals to the central nervous system, which sends feedback through the parasympathetic autonomic system in order to lower blood pressure. And this reflex plays a role in maintaining blood pressure when a person stands up or lies down. So someone lies down, pressure increases, and it tells the system lower blood pressure. They stand up, pressure decreases, we, re we stop sending information to the parasympathetic system, and pressure returns back up. A second is called the basal gyrus reflex. This uses mechanical and chemosensitive receptors in the walls of the ventricle. And it leads to, basically what happens is a vagal outflow and a classic triad of bradycardia, vasodilation, and apnea occurs. We see this in patients who have been in an upright posture for a prolonged period of time, especially if they're vasodilated. And what happens is the patient becomes uh, volume depleted, and as a result, they start to have tachycardia, which we expect. And that increase in heart rate and contractility causes the ventricular wall to get overstimulated. And then this paradoxical reflex occurs. The ventricular wall gets touched, it gets stimulated, and the basal gyrus reflex causes vagal outflow, and the patient becomes bradycardic, vasodilated, and apneic. This may explain the bradycardia and circulatory collapse that people have seen after spinal anesthesia or interscaling brachial plexus blocks. The third reflex we're going to mention is the Bainbridge reflex. This involves stretch receptors that are at the junction of the vena cava and the right atrium, and at the junction of the pulmonary vein into the left atrium. These receptors respond to changes in volume in your central thoracic compartment, and they will inhibit vagal outflow and enhance sympathetic outflow to your SA node, causing increased heart rate. So for example, a woman delivers an infant. A large volume of uteroplacental blood transfuses back into her circulation. If someone gets a big volume infusion, you would expect their heart rate to go down. But for some reason, her heart rate goes up. That might be due to the Bainbridge reflex, and these stretch receptors get stretched, and they inhibit vagal outflow and increase heart rate. Or a patient, a person who spontaneously inhales, which causes increased intrathoracic, which causes decreased intrathoracic pressure. It causes increased venous return, yet heart rate goes up during inspiration. This may be due to the brain bridge reflex. The, now that we've discussed some nervous system controls of blood pressure, we're going to discuss some renal controls of blood pressure. The topic is called pressure diuresis and natriuresis. In other words, pressure causing loss of water, diuresis, and natriuresis, loss of sodium. As blood pressure increases, your urinary water output and sodium excretion will increase in order to restore normal blood pressure. This can occur within an hour, and chronically, your body can make long-term accommodations as well. This is one of the key determinants of your long-term arterial blood pressure. In this figure, we see a patient who has healthy kidneys. This patient has a normal arterial pressure of about, looks like 90, and they have a normal intake and output of salt and water. The patient acutely increases their intake in of salt or water, and that causes an acute increase in their blood pressure. Immediately, this elevated blood pressure will cause the body to increase urine output, increase sodium output, until blood pressure returns back to normal. Now, chronically, let's say instead of the patient doing this once, they take on a new diet where they're taking in very large amounts of salt and water every day. Well, we don't want 
their blood pressure to constantly be going up and down. And over time, the body becomes much better tolerant of this. And as the patient takes in large amounts of salt or water over and over again, blood pressure will not change that much. But salt and water output will increase in order to maintain the same blood pressure. This works when blood pressure is reduced as well. A patient uh, has low blood pressure, the body will decrease renal output of salt and water so that you retain salt and water in order to return blood pressure back up to normal. Patients who have kidney disease may have a more slanted curve. Patients who have healthy kidneys in the chronic setting will have a more vertical curve. One key point that you must remember is that salt is the main determinant of extracellular fluid volume. Any excess free water is immediately excreted by healthy kidneys in order to maintain normal serum osmolarity and normal serum sodium levels. If you have excess sodium, which increases osmolarity, that will stimulate thirst and antidiuretic hormone will immediately decrease renal excretion of water in order to maintain normal osmolarity. But if you have increased salt and water levels, that's going to increase your blood pressure, and pressure diuresis comes into play in order to restore normal levels. The renin angiotensin system plays an important role in controlling blood pressure. It starts with renin. Renin is secreted by the kidney. Renin acts on an enzyme called angiotensinogen, which is made by the liver. And when there is low blood pressure, the kidney will secrete renin, and this will convert angiotensinogen into angiotensin 1. Angiotensin 1 is converted by an enzyme called ACE, angiotensin converting enzyme, which is secreted by the lungs. And that converts angiotensin 1 into angiotensin 2. Now, angiotensin 2 already has some effects. It is a vasoconstrictor. It decreases your renal excretion of salt and water, so it causes you to retain salt and water. And finally, angiotensin 2 acts on the adrenal glands, causing them to secrete aldosterone. And aldosterone makes the kidneys save sodium and pee potassium. So when sodium intake is increased and your extracellular volume increases because water follows the sodium and therefore your blood pressure increases, high blood pressure is going to decrease your renin. It's going to decrease your angiotensinogen. It's going to decrease your aldosterone. It's going to make you stop retaining salt and water and you will have diuresis and naturesis and your volume and your blood pressure will return back to normal. That's the end of that discussion about blood pressure. In the next section, we'll talk about some pathophysiology.